Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go. Romans chapter 7. Paul says, Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives? For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, while her husband lives, or excuse me, so then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law, through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear bear fruit to God. So notice he's talking about death and obligation. He's saying that if a person is under the law, talking about the law of Moses, well, if that person dies, they're not under the law anymore. And he's saying it's just like when a man and a woman get married, and it's supposed to be till death do us part. And he said, but if one of them dies, the other is released from that vow because it's till death do us part. Well, death has parted them. So he said, they're totally released. He said, in the same way. Now listen to this application. He said, therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ. In other words, when you made Jesus the Lord of your life, that was you who died on the cross with Jesus. And so, therefore, you died. You're no longer under the law because that old person is dead. That's the way God sees it. God sees that Jesus on the cross was you on the cross because you put your faith in his sacrifice being for you. So God says, oh, yeah, that person died. They're no longer under the law. And so it says, therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ that you may be married to another. So he continues with this theme of marriage and he's saying now that you're no longer married to the law now you can be married to another and who does it say to him who was raised from the dead okay well who is that that's the Lord Jesus Christ to him who was raised from the dead that we should bear fruit to God verse 5 for when we were in the flesh the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. What does that mean, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law? In other words, the more the do's and the don'ts were in our face, so to speak, and in our minds, the more we were aware of the options to sin. The the questions or the commandments were causing us to think about it from that perspective, and we realized that our flesh was still tempted to do it. And so he said that the law actually, because it was just do's and don'ts, actually aroused that temptation to sin. Somebody might say, then why did God give us the law? Well, this is what we've already covered in previous chapters. God knew that we needed a Savior, that there's no way we could measure up in obedience to be righteous before the Lord and go to heaven. There's no way. First of all, we were born in sin, so we already started at not just a disadvantage, we started off disqualified. It's, it was already over at birth because we were born with the sin of Adam. And then since we were born, we continued to sin. And God saw there, there's no way for them to deal with it because the punishment against sin of death still has to be paid. But when Jesus died with innocent blood, then we can accept his death for us. And so Paul is saying, look, the commandments aroused passion within you toward sin, which brought death. Verse 6, but now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by. In other words, now that we're in Jesus Christ, we're not under this, hey, you got to do this and you got to do that and you got to do the other. 
No, we can think in, uh, from a perspective of grace, like, oh, God has enabled us. He's given us grace. We're not disqualified anymore. We're not at a disadvantage anymore. We're at an advantage now because we start off completely forgiven <laughs> every day. His mercies are new every morning, every day. If you, can, if you sinned, you just confess it, and you get completely washed. So you get to start off as a perfect person again by the blood of Jesus that washes you. See, so we're not, we don't have the disqualifications nor the disadvantages that we used to have under the law or under sin. So, but now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law has said, you shall not covet. But sin taking opportunity by the commandment. See, it's not the commandment that's tripping us up, but it's the sin inside of us that takes opportunity by the commandment. The commandment says, hey, don't cross that line. And sin says, oh, I want to cross that line. It's sort of like, you know, we do this with our children, and now I do it with my grandchildren, that uh, you'll say, hey, don't you dare. Don't you dare do this. And then as soon as you say that, they get this look on their face like, oh, I want to do that. Well, they wouldn't have even thought of doing that unless you would have said, don't you dare do it. In the same way, when God brought the law to help everybody to see like a mirror how much sin was really in their life, it actually aroused more of a desire in the flesh to sin. Not that the commandment's bad, but that the sin's bad. And the flesh is the flesh just wants to sin. And so the more you show the flesh what is sin and what's not sin, the more the flesh has, it's powerless to be able to do right. The flesh just has this propensity to sin. So once again, it says here, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. In other words, when when there was nobody saying, you can't do this, you know, the passions weren't aroused. So did sin still happen? Yes, it did, but not as much. But he's saying, for apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking uh, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it killed me. Therefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, see, Paul's saying, let's put the blame where it should be, not on the commandment of God, but on the sin. That yes, when the commandment says something, sin wants to sin. But he's saying, that's not a commandment problem, that's a sin problem. So he says, it's certainly not that the law has become death. He said, but sin that it might appear sin was producing death in me through what is good so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Now, this is a section that's so important. He goes on to say in verse 15, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, I think it's easier for us to understand if we replace the word will with the word want. Because that's what it means, what I will or choose to do. So let me say it this way. For what I will or want to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will or want not to do or don't want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Now listen to that statement. Paul saying, I'm doing what I don't want to do. I'm not doing what I do want to do. He said, but when I sin, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. If you don't understand what he's talking about, it doesn't make sense. It's, it's not I, but it's sin that dwells in me. Wait a minute. So you didn't sin, but the sin that dwells in you sinned? See, it doesn't make sense. It, it's almost as if he is trying to escape from responsibility. Uh, but he's not. He's acknowledging 
the responsibility. But I also want you to remember that as Paul said to the Thessalonians in, I believe, chapter 5, verse 23, now may the God of peace sanctify you wholly and may your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus. So notice, we're made up of spirit, soul, and body. And when you get born again, your spirit is born into the family of God. It's renewed. It's full of the life of God. The Holy Spirit's in there. But your soul, which is made up of your mind, your will, your emotions, well, that did not get born again. So that you're still dealing with, and it has these old thought patterns, these old habits, these old desires and likes. See? And then you've got your body, and your body just likes to be pleased, likes to be comfortable, likes pleasure and such. And so uh, we've got these three parts. So Paul is saying, look, the real me inside, the born-again spirit, I don't want to do those things. But I find myself as a whole person doing those things that I don't want to do. And there are other things that I do want to do that I, from my spirit, I will to do it, I want to do it, but I don't end up doing those things. So he says, but when I sin, but I didn't want to sin, it's not me, it's not me, this born again spirit inside that's sinning, but it's the sin that dwells in me. In other words, in other parts of me. In other, in other words, in the flesh. My, sin, my flesh is still prone to sin, hasn't been saved yet. My mind is still being renewed. My emotions, my will inside is still prone to those old habits of sin and, and satisfying and gratifying the flesh. He's saying, so it's not me, this born-again person inside, but it's, it's sin that's in another part of me that keeps pulling me, dragging me toward that. So he said, but now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I believe that's talking about the Spirit. And you'll see as we read through this, I won't take the time to have you circle certain words like I normally like to do when I'm teaching this, but I'll just interject in there when I believe he's talking about the Spirit, okay? So, uh, but it is no longer I, the Spirit, who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, Nothing good dwells, for to will or to want to do right is present with me, spirit. But how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I, the spirit man, will to do or want to do, I do not do. But the evil that I, the spirit man, will not to do or don't want to do, that I as a whole person end up practicing. Now if I do what I, the spirit man, will not to do or don't want to do. It is no longer I, the spirit man, who do it, but sin that dwells in me as a whole person. In another part of me, in other words, I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. The spirit, the born again spirit inside, evil is present with me. Where? Well, in the soul, not in the spirit, but in the soul, in the body, there's evil, evil desires, desires to sin, temptations, desire to succumb to the temptations. He said, it's right here. It's present with me. I feel it inside that I want to do it as a whole person, but I, the, the spirit part of me, doesn't want to do it. I want to please God. Okay, so look at this. Verse 22. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. Now you see there, Paul just divided it up. I delight in the law of God according to the inward, inward man. This is talking about the born-again spirit. Verse 23, but I see another law in my members. Members are the body parts, the arms, the legs, the mouth, and such. I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. Here's the soul. The law of the mind would be the law of God. What's right, what's wrong, the do's and the don'ts. I see another law in my members, my body, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me as a whole person into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So the law of sin is in his body. The law of sin, the, the body is prone to sin, to do whatever is, is pleasurable. Verse 24, and oh, wretched man that I am. What is he saying? Man, this is a mess. This is a mess. Somebody said, I thought when you get saved, all the problems go away. Well, there's a part of you that gets born again and wants to please God, but there are other parts of you that are yet to be saved. One day our bodies will be changed from corruptible to incorruptible, from mortal, subject to death, to immortality. 
But right now, they still have that old sin habit and the sin desire inside. And our minds are being renewed, and that will at least be uh, accelerated at the end of the age when Jesus comes back. So he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Back in uh, ancient days, sometimes they would do this to prisoners. They would actually strap a dead corpse uh, to a man, arms to arms, legs to legs and such, and they'd have to carry around this dead corpse for a while. And I think Paul is referencing something like this, like, man, inside I want to serve God, but I've got these other parts of me that I feel like I'm dragging them towards serving God. They want to serve the flesh. They want to serve pleasure. They want to succumb to sin. And I feel like there's this constant war going on. Well, if you thought getting saved was going to solve all the problems, really it created a conflict because before you got saved, you could have been in unity about what you were going to do. But now that you're saved, your born again spirit says, no, we have to serve God. And there are other parts of you that said, hey, don't tell us what to do. We've been in charge all these years and we don't have to listen to you. And we as spirit, born again spirits, we have to, from the inside, we have to say, no, we're going to do it the way God says to do it. You're not in charge anymore. I'm in charge now. And so, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, listen to this, with the mind, I myself. That's interesting, isn't it? With the mind, I myself. See, he's dividing himself up and he's clarifying that he is, has these different parts. With the mind, I myself, and this I myself is the spirit, the born again spirit. With the mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin, in other words, I can renew my mind and get my mind to come over and to begin to think the right thoughts. But the body <laughs> is just going to have to be dragged along and disciplined because the body just does not learn. The body is the body is the body. But I can get that mind over here with me. And if I can get the spirit and the mind, the soul together, agreeing on the word of God and what's right and what's wrong, we'll make our body. Now we can make our body do the right thing. Uh, get up when we need to get up. Go to bed when we need to get, go to bed. Get away from temptation when we need to get away from temptation, temptation, etc. But you've got to get the spirit and the mind working together. Well, that's it for Romans chapter 7. It's really an encouraging passage because the apostle of God who wrote half of the books of the New Testament is admitting that he has these same kind of issues that we all have in wanting to serve God exactly the way the Bible says to do it. And we have these other parts of us that are just dragging their feet, digging their heels into the ground. And so what do we do? We don't give up. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. And the flesh, we're just going to have to drag that flesh along because it always wants to serve the law of sin. Don't miss tomorrow because Romans chapter 8 is, in my opinion, the crown jewel of the book of Romans. It, all of these chapters that we've read so far and studied lead up to the, the culmination of this beautiful chapter, Romans chapter 8. I'll see you tomorrow.